account, they're floating on your money. That's the same thing that the state was doing. They were taking your money on an interim basis and they were only paying you a couple of times a year back. And they were doing that through your property taxes. They're supposed to now reimburse your sales tax. So you should see a bump in your sales tax and your property tax go down. Now historically, you can see that sales tax within, this is very hard to read, but I think in the, in the packages you have, it's a little bit easier. You can see that historically over the years, both the state and local communities have received more revenue and the amount of tax has increased. So many, many decades ago, we didn't charge that much sales tax and we're continually charging more and more sales tax and we're collecting it. Uh, and also local governments are collecting a larger portion. This is really important. While local add-ons and transaction and use taxes, this is the portion that you have control over. You can charge up to 2% more at the local level for programs, for your own budgets. You can either make that specific, some communities do it for road improvements, public safety, they'll do it for libraries, or you can make it for general fund use. This is just an example of how other communities have, have dealt with this topic. This is just sort of a letting you know that this does get a little complicated. Now location, this is the chart that I was talking to you about. Transaction and use taxes. What is applicable when? This is the most complicated part of this. If a retailer and a customer are both within the same area, that's when a transaction tax is collected. So say you're buying lumber and you're gonna use the lumber in the same area, you can, that's when you collect it. If the retailer and the customer are outside the local area, there's no transaction or use tax that's being applicable here, even, even if they bring it here. If the retailer within the, and the customer are outside the local taxing area, then this chart starts to play in. Where is the customer picking it up? Are they picking it up at another location that might be? So maybe they've made the transaction in another county, but they have a site here where they actually pick up the materials. Then a transaction tax is applicable here within the county. Are the seller or the carrier ships or delivers the property outside of the lo local area? It doesn't get delivered here? Then neither are applicable. If the property is sold outside of the local taxing area and brought in to either be consumed or stored here, then the use tax is applicable. So here you are a retailer and you have to track sales tax, transaction tax, and use tax. And I'm gonna tell you a lot of small businesses really don't understand this and they read through the materials. And uh, let, me just, let me just make this really simple. You're a local liquor store and you're shipping wine for a party to another part of the county. Fort Bragg, Mendocino, it's purchased here in Ukiah, but you're shipping it to someplace else. How do you know what you're applying? You can see why perhaps people make errors in this. It gets more and more confusing all the time. In fact, it's so confusing that the state is now looking at completely overhauling the system. Great. Now, if we go further, if you're a, a retailer outside and the customer is in within the local taxing area the use tax is applicable now this is what this is the part that the next one is the one that Tom was talking about if the retailer has multiple locations this is where it kicks in on how is it attributable this this handy chart on page 12 tells you the most common problem we have at looking at the county's analysis. You may have multiple gas stations or multiple McDonald's. These are not franchises that are separately owned, but actually corporate on multiple locations. This chart comes into, uh, into play there, and they will not give you a specific address. It's just collected, and there is an address that's, there's actually a, a number that's tagged by the state. You can think of it as a business license number for the state. And they'll know that it the money has to come back to the county, but I can't tell you from that breakout if you're collecting that outside the limits of Ukiah, outside the limits of Fort Bragg. I can only tell you by zip code where you're 
where it's actually getting delivered. So that breaks it down somewhat within the county, but that's about the only way. There are certain businesses where we don't have a physical address for them. Does that make sense? Because they're corporate owned and they're collecting all the money in one location and they're bringing it back because they know they have a certain number of employees at various sites. Are you starting to understand how complicated this gets? Now, there's also all kinds of exceptions in the law. If it's a vending machine, there are special exceptions written into the law. If it's an itinerant mercher, merchant, one of those guys that's selling burritos out of a van, there's different laws that are applicable. If it's an auctioneer, so it's a one-day sale of some kind, different laws are applicable. And then there are all kinds of special laws just for contractors. And depending upon the type of contractor and the type of material you buy, and whether it's pre-assembled or wholly assembled, it gets much and much more complicated as you go down and start reading the fine print. Now, of course, for many small businesses, this just gets really, really, really overwhelming. Now, if the retailer, now here, it all breaks down to certain terminology. And this is where your attorney, your county attorney, can assist you. And the terminology is such that if you're engaged in business, and there are special meanings for what that means, do you have a physical site? That's one of the, uh, one of the criteria. Do you have someone who actually comes in and out, such as a sales or a salesperson on a regular basis? 